Today's episode contains descriptions of violence and adult language that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Additionally, there is discussion of self-harm, which may be triggering for some. It's March 28, 1995. Patrizia is standing on Corso Venezia, one of the fanciest streets in Milan, and she's banging on the door of his lavish three-story apartment. Usually, Patrizia avoids this block entirely. Honestly, just the sight of her ex's front door makes her sick. Since the divorce, Patrizia has been struggling financially. Mauricio's barely given her enough to pay her bills. Her grocer and pharmacist have cut off her credit. Meanwhile, Maurizio has been living it up with his new girlfriend, Paola. This apartment rents for, wait for it, about $40,000 a month. Mm, so a steal by LA standards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the apartment's recent upgrades cost millions. What, are they using Lamborghinis as coffee tables? <laughs> I mean, close. Maurizio and Paola have gone all out. There's a Western-themed saloon with studded leather couches and a desert painted across the wall. The dining room furniture belonged to a former king of Italy. Maurizio and Paola's four-post bed looks like it's straight out of Versailles. Patrizia keeps on banging. She's had enough of Maurizio living a five-star life without her. She's been shut out and forgotten. But that ends today. The door finally swings open. Paola looks down at Patrizia with red, swollen eyes. You don't waste any time, do you? Patrizia just holds her chin high. She says, I'm the mother of his heirs. Well, you're not even his widow. This three-story apartment is now her daughter's, which also means it's hers. It hasn't even been 24 hours since Maurizio's death, but Patrizia is here to kick Paola to the curb. Damn, this woman's colder than her ex-husband's body. Truly, and it's even worse than that. She filed a court order to evict Paola literally two hours after Maurizio's death. This is her, what the fuck are you still doing here, check-in. Paola crosses her arms and tells Patrizia, not to worry, the movers are already on their way. Patrizia smiles and tells her she'll be checking to make sure none of Maurizio's possessions leave with her. A few days later, at Maurizio's funeral, some journalists ask Patrizia how she's handling his death. She says, on a human level, I'm sorry. On a personal level, I can't say the same thing. Mm. Soon after the funeral, Patrizia moves into Maurizio's apartment. She takes long, leisurely baths in his bathroom and then slips into his terry cloth bathrobe. At night, she sleeps in his fancy four-post bed. For the first time in years, she feels at peace. As she tells one of her friends, he may have died, but I have just begun to live. From Wondery, I'm Brooke Sifrin. And I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. And this is Even the Rich. In our last episode, Maurizio Gucci ascended the Gucci throne and then exiled his entire family from the kingdom, including the wife who'd become his most trusted advisor. Maurizio and Maurizio alone would rule the Gucci empire. But it turned out that Maurizio wasn't very good at running Gucci. In fact, he quickly ran Gucci into the ground. Along the way, he racked up millions in debt and a long list of enemies. On March 27th, a hitman took down Maurizio in broad daylight. It was the murder of the century. As a story, it had everything. A famous family, a vengeful ex-wife, high fashion glitz and glamor. But as an investigation, it came with an unusual problem too many suspects. When everyone hates the victim, everyone has a motive. This is episode three, not guilty, not innocent. It's January 8th, 1997, nearly two years since Maurizio Gucci was shot outside his office. No arrests have been made, 
But the chief of police, Filippo Nini, isn't giving up. In fact, he's made it his New Year's resolution to close this case. Okay, well, that's one way to make sure it'll never happen. Truly the ultimate jinx. But Filippo has been working nonstop. He's got the best track record in his department for putting criminals behind bars. This isn't going to be the case that ruins that. He has a couple more weeks before the case officially goes cold and his bosses pull him off it. Filippo sits at his desk, leans back in his chair, and looks at his wall where he's hung pictures of all the suspects. He strokes his dark mustache as he stares at them for the hundredth time and thinks, who could have done it and why? His eyes land on photos of the Gucci family. They fought viciously over the business for years, so maybe this is revenge? His cousin Paolo is a pretty angry guy, but is he angry enough to shoot Maurizio? I mean, he did get his own father sent to prison. True. Filippo's eyes shift. Hmm, what about the Swiss mafia? These guys were not happy that Maurizio was trying to open a casino in a Swiss resort town. That's their turf. And then there's the New York mafia. It's rumored Maurizio owed them money. And now he's swimming with the fishes. That was terrifying. (laughs) Filippo's eyes move on to Paolo Franchi. The girlfriend is always a suspect. But then again, so is the ex-wife. And Patrizia did threaten to kill him, multiple times. Filippo sits back, exasperated. There are too many suspects, all with good motives. He's back where he started. He just needs a lead, a clue, something. Filippo picks up the phone and snaps, Hello? This better be important. Mm, That's exactly how I answer the phone. Okay, stop acting like you answer your phone. (laughs) A low, raspy voice comes through and says, It is. He says he has information pertaining to Maurizio Gucci's death. Filippo perks up and asks to meet ASAP. The man agrees. As he hangs up the phone, Filippo prays that this is the break he needs to blow the whole case wide open. But when Filippo meets his mystery informant, his hopes begin to fall. Gabriele Capronesi lumbers up the steps to the police station. When they sit down, he's still wheezing. But then he launches into a very, very wild story. Try to follow along. Gabrielli rented a room at the Hotel Adri. It's cheap and crappy, but it does have a doorman. His name is Ivano Savioni, and he's a multitasker. He greets people and also collects the rent. When Gabrielli fell short on cash, he begged Ivano not to evict him. He said he's good for it, and he'll have it as soon as his next big drug deal goes down. Wait, Gabrielli's a drug dealer? No, he's a liar. Okay, not a great trait for an informant. No, not at all. Filippo shifts in his chair. He's starting to worry that this is a complete bust, but Gabrielli assures him that everything he's saying is on the up and up. Desperate and with no other leads, Filippo stays put and listens. Gabrielli says that Ivano let him stay and even began to confide in him, criminal to criminal. He brags that he's owed a big fat sum of money for organizing the assassination of Maurizio Gucci. Filippo is floored. If this story is true, he stands a chance at finding out who pulled the trigger and who ordered the hit. But it's a big if. He's going to need more than this unreliable source. And getting other people to talk isn't going to be easy. Gabrielli is back home at Hotel Adri. He's hanging out with his pal Ivano, the doorman. And Gabrielli's invited another guy into the mix, Carlos. Carlos has curly blonde hair and the icy blue eyes of a hardened man. He's wearing a big gold chain around his neck, a flashy diamond pinky ring, and a wire. He's an undercover detective. Filippo's sitting in a van outside the hotel listening to everything in this room. This sting was all his idea. When he heard that Ivano was still owed money from the hit on Maurizio, he saw it as an opportunity, an angle he could exploit. If Ivano was still angry about the money he was owed, they could probably get him to talk. Angry people love to talk. Filippo just needed to find the right person for Ivano to talk to. And that's where Carlos comes in. 
The undercover detective is pretending to be a hitman for the Medellin drug cartel. He tells Ivano he has the connections to shake down the masterminds who hired him and get them to finally pay up. And then, in case Ivano's doubting him, Carlos casually drops in that he's murdered over a hundred people. A hundred people? That seems like a lot. Yeah. While Carlos's bravado is working, Ivano's amazed. He's so starstruck that he gives Carlos cash for dinner and insists he takes his car for the night. So Ivano is as dumb as a bag of rocks. Arisha, don't insult rocks. <laughs> Filippo can't believe his luck. Once they get the car, they can install microphones and a location tracker. Then, all Filippo has to do is wait and hope that this elaborate plan works because it's a long shot. But it's the only shot they have. Filippo trails Ivano all over Milan, listening to the calls he makes from his car. Most of it's boring. He watches him pick up dry cleaning, buy groceries. He hears him talk to his mother about what they're having for dinner. But one day, he dials a different number. And Patrizia's best friend, Pina, answers. Oh shit, the psychic. Yeah, Filippo is shocked. Now he wants to know exactly how Ivano knows Pina. Well, I'm guessing he's not getting his birth chart. <laughs> I mean, maybe he is, but today they skip right past all 12 of his houses. He tells Pina he has a solution to their problems. He's coming to pick her up because they need to talk in person. They drive around Milan and he tells her all about Carlos, the hitman, how he's the real deal and could help them. And as a psychic, she calls bullshit and reveals that Carlos is an undercover cop. <laughs> well, apparently Pina's powers aren't working that day. She's actually really into this Carlos idea. <laughs> like Ivano, she's been waiting for her money. And also like Ivano, she's been waiting too long. It's time for Patrizia to pay up. And there it is. It's Patrizia. Yep. Filippo nearly falls off his seat. This case was cold for two years. And with just one car ride, it's become scorching hot. Over the next few weeks, the whole crew of accomplices places dozens of calls to each other, and Filippo wiretaps every last sentence. He gets Pina calling Ivano, and Ivano calling the gunman, and Ivano calling Pina. Sometimes Pina even calls Patrizia. But Patrizia is different from the rest. She never says anything that could implicate her. Filippo keeps waiting for her to slip up, but after days of tapping her phone, he's starting to wonder if she's too smart for him to get her, at least this way. It's 4.30 a.m. on January 31st, 1997. Filippo impatiently buzzes the bell at Corso Venezia, Maurizio's old apartment, a.k.a. Patrizia's new pad. He's here at this ungodly hour with an arrest warrant and a small army of officers. Police, open up! Finally, a sleepy maid opens the heavy wooden entry door. Filippo leads his crew into the courtyard, across a mosaic floor, and up a grand marble staircase to Patrizia's open front door. They file in and try not to stare, but it's hard. Ceiling frescoes look down at them. Two ducks waddle into the room. A turtle in the corner retreats into its shell. And on the wall directly in front of them, there's a larger-than-life oil painting of Patrizia. <laughs> I'm guessing Maurizio and Paolo didn't put it up there. No, they didn't. <laughs> Obviously, this is not like Filippo's typical arrests, but his job is the same. Patrizia enters the room and stands tall. She holds her chin high, despite her I-just-woke-up hair. Filippo grumbles to himself. She looks like she's above this, but she is not above the law. Filippo asks Patrizia if she knows why they're here. She says, you've come because of my husband's death. She still calls Maurizio her husband. Filippo takes note. Very strange. He tells Patrizia she's under arrest. She must come with them immediately. He tells her to get dressed and a female officer will escort her. Filippo keeps his eyes fixed on Patrizia, ready for her to refuse. But she gives a slight nod and goes with the officer. Filippo thinks, fine, keep your poker face. I'll keep mine too, and I have more cards than you. At least he's pretty sure he does. 
Filippo notices his officers just standing there. Some are eyeing the ducks who have been joined by a cocker spaniel. Others are taking in the bronze centaurs on either side of the entrance. Well, he yells, everyone snaps back to attention. I believe we have a search to perform. The squad hops to it. Two begin searching the sitting room and the rest hustle deeper into the house. When the female officer escorts Patrizia back into the room, Filippo does a double take. Patrizia strides into the room in a full-length mink coat and her finest jewelry. Of course she does. <laughs> yeah. Filippo is tempted to think this woman is insane, but he remembers how she's evaded him, how smart she's been not to incriminate herself on her tapped phone line. This woman is cunning. He's not sure what she's up to, but he's not going to underestimate her. On the outside, he gives no reaction. Patrizia picks up her leather Gucci handbag and slides on a pair of dark sunglasses. Ma'am, he says, the sun isn't out yet. Patrizia jerks her head toward the female officer at her side and sneers, she wouldn't let me put on my makeup. Filippo's not going to argue with that. He leads her out the door. But as they go, he stops. He turns back and calls, search everywhere. I want to see everything you find that's even a little suspicious. I know there's evidence here that'll lock her up for good. And Filippo really hopes there is. Even though he's acting cocky and confident, he's nervous. He needs some concrete evidence tying her to Maurizio's murder. Without receipts to show that she conspired to kill, he's scared that this whole case could fall apart. And Patrizia could get away with murder. When you're building a great team, you need to find people with skills that complement each other. Yeah, just like us. We're a great team. Ugh, the greatest. <laughs> so when our listeners are building their team, how can they find the people with the right skills? Richies, if you're hiring, you need Indeed. Indeed is your go-to hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. That means you won't struggle on your own to find quality candidates because Indeed can help you hire the right people right now. One of the things that I think is the coolest about Indeed is that 73% of all online job seekers in the U.S. visit Indeed each month, according to Comscore Total Visits, which means they're already there, ready for you. Yes, and thanks to Indeed's virtual interviews, you can message, schedule, and interview top talent seamlessly, all in one place. And there's no need to install anything extra. Indeed's virtual interviews work from your browser. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash rich. That's a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash rich. One more time, that's Indeed.com slash rich. Offer valid through December 31st. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. You know, Arisha, I got to say, I'm feeling a little stressed today. Oh, no. Is there <laughs> anything I can do? I mean, we could switch bodies. That would work. Freaky I'll go to Friday. Sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, I think I'll be fine. Um, but I bring it up because lately you and I have been trying out the CBD gummies mm -hmm. from our sponsor, Plus CBD. And when I'm feeling a little overwhelmed, I'm really finding that they're helping support a sense of calm. Yeah. Uh, can't agree more. Plus CBD is San Diego's trusted CBD brand and the number one selling natural hemp extract in the U.S. And I'm with you. I'm really enjoying their calm gummies. And also the sleep gummies. <laughs> Daily use of Plus CBD sleep gummies gets you the rest you need so you can wake up feeling focused and refreshed. Yeah, honestly, I love the taste of them. They're made with award-winning CBD combined with melatonin, magnolia bark, and lemon balm. Yeah, the pure ingredients in Plus CBD gummies can help reduce stress, alleviate soreness, and improve your overall sleep. Sleep better tonight at pluscbdoil.com. Enter promo code RICH for 40% off your order. That's pluscbdoil.com, promo code RICH for 40% off your order. It's April 1998, two months before the trial is set to begin. Milan prosecutor Carlo Nocciarino waves away the cameraman crowding the sidewalk. He just wants to get to work. He's a serious man with bushy Oscar the Grouch eyebrows and large bags under his eyes. This case has kept him up late every night this week, 
and he has no time or patience for the media. He gives them his best fuck off look, then disappears inside. But his office is also pure chaos. Towers of filing boxes loom over him. Every day, another box arrives full of evidence against Patrizia. Nocerino barely has room to get to his desk. Right now, a clerk is wheeling in box number 34. Nocerino knows what he'll probably find in it. More tapes, transcripts, and depositions. Filippo's team gave them everything they had, including diaries and bank statements from Patrizia's apartment. Brick by brick, or box by box, the prosecution is building their case, and it's solid. But even after 15 months in prison, Patrizia herself refuses to talk. Nocerino calls in an assistant to help him go through this latest box. He's rolling up his sleeves and crouching over the box when a detective appears at his door, smiling. We're getting our confession. Nocerino looks up. From Patrizia? The detective shakes his head. No. From Pina. Nocerino stands up straight. Pina's been in jail for months, but she hasn't said a word. She refuses to betray her BFF. I mean, a regular paying customer is hard to come by. Uh, Agree. Nocerino considers this turn of events. Why is Pina talking, he asks. What changed? The detective laughs. Apparently, from one jail cell to another, Patrizia passed along a secret message. If Pina took the fall, she'd give her best friend two billion lira, which is about $2.5 million. Patrizia said she would shower her cell with gold. I mean, two and a half million dollars can buy you a lot of cigarettes. (laughs) True, but it was totally the wrong move. Pina was pissed and immediately sent her own message back. I'll paraphrase. What the fuck am I going to do with all that money if I'm spending the rest of my life in jail, you entitled bitch? So not a smoker. And then Pina sent off a second message to the police. She's ready to talk. Hell yeah, she is. Nocerino is over the moon. It's not a confession from Patrizia, but it's the next best thing. Her friend is turning against her. With Pina's help, Nocerino is going to have everything he needs to take Patrizia down. It's June 1998 at Milan's courthouse. Television trucks park up and down the street and reporters pack the courtroom. This is day one of Patrizia's trial and all of Italy is watching. It's basically their version of the O.J. Simpson trial. Instead of Marsha Clark and her perm, you have Nocerino and his eyebrows. And instead of O.J., you have Patrizia. I love how America gets an ex-athlete and Italy gets an ex-wife from a fashion house. Feels very (laughs) on brand. Very. But there are a couple other important differences between O.J.'s trial and Patrizia's. In O.J.'s, it was just O.J. on trial. In this one... Everyone from the getaway driver to Patrizia is on trial, but with separate lawyers. So it's like a legal battle royale. Exactly. Everyone's out for themselves. Instead of the people versus OJ, this is the people versus Patrizia versus Pina versus Ivano versus the hitman versus the getaway driver. Mm, No wonder this wasn't made into a miniseries. That's a horrible title. (laughs) Rolls right off the tongue. (laughs) And here's something else you'd never see on American TV. While Patrizia gets to sit next to her lawyer... The hitman and the getaway driver have to stand in a dingy cage off to the side because they're considered the violent criminals in the room. Um, objection, prejudicial. But Nocerino hopes this setup can work to his advantage. It's going to remind everyone that there's a huge class gap among the accused. The poorest people have to stand in cages and the richest get to sit next to their fancy lawyers. He wants the jury to see how entitled Patrizia is and turn on her just like Pina did. In his opening argument, Nocerino doesn't miss a beat. He paints Patrizia as a spoiled princess who spirals out of control when Maurizio leaves her and she loses social status. When she hears Maurizio is planning to marry a new Mrs. Gucci, which would jeopardize her daughter's inheritance, she snaps. She turns to her cash-strapped best friend Pina and dangles money at her to find a hitman. And then, because Patrizia's so entitled, she stiffs Pina and her hired goons after the deed is done. 
It's a memorable portrait of a monster. A woman who's so spoiled she thinks she should get everything she wants, including her ex's death. Over the next few days, Nocherino leads a parade of witnesses to the stand who corroborate his version of the story. There's Maurizio's housekeeper, who called Patrizia to tell her about the murder and was floored by Patrizia's reaction. She didn't sound sad at all. And then, while they were still on the call, she put on classical music. Okay, that's a total villain move. Yeah. And then there's Patrizia's banker, who just happened to deliver packets of cash to Pina on Patrizia's orders in the same exact amount as the first payment for the hit. Sounds a lot like a glove that fits. Mm, love that reference. Patrizia later clears this up by saying she does all of her banking in cash. Mm, mm-hmm, sure, same girl. <laughs> and then Pina herself takes the stand, and her testimony is to the point and brutal. She describes how Patrizia wanted to kill Maurizio herself, but didn't have the nerve. Pina only agreed to help Patrizia in a moment of desperation for the money. Through all of this, Nocciarino keeps an eye on Patrizia, What is she thinking? What is she planning? By the looks of it, not much. Her hair's uncombed. She looks slowed down and dazed. Instead of wearing designer duds, she's in cotton pants, a polo shirt, and a nautical sweater. By Patrizia's standards, everything about this J. Crew look spells defeat. Well, except for the four-inch heels, but I'm honestly not sure she even takes those off to sleep. Or to clean her room. I mean, she's not you. By the way, everyone, DM me if you want a pick of that. But the point is, she looks like she's given up, which is exactly what Nocerino wants. Entitlement has been Patrizia's superpower, and Nocerino is going to chip away at it until there's nothing left. Next up is Patrizia's attorney, Gaetano Pecarella. Gaetano walks to the front of the courtroom, adjusts his very expensive suit, and runs a hand through his perfect hair. He concedes that, yes, Patrizia hated Maurizio, and that everything the prosecution laid out is true. Wow, okay. She did want her ex dead. She made no secret of that. And she did pay Pina for the murder. The numbers on her bank statement don't lie. But it's still not what you think. Gaetano announces it was Pina, not Patrizia, who organized the murder of Maurizio Gucci. Pina carried it all out on her own. And once the deed was done, she came to Patrizia and told her she'd pin the murder on her. Unless Patrizia paid up. Too bad Pina didn't see this coming. (laughs) Seriously. Gaetano gives this latest twist a moment to sink in. And then he continues. This is not a case about a contract killing. This is a case about blackmail. About a rich, angry woman, mentally unstable and physically weakened from a brain tumor, who was taken advantage of by her best friend. So yes, Patrizia did pay Pina the $365,000, but only to save herself from being framed. I'm sure everyone watching rolled their eyes so hard they saw their brain, but then her lawyers submit a signed letter into evidence. Patrizia deposited it with a Milan notary just a few days after the murder. It reads, I have been forced to pay hundreds of millions of lira for the safety of myself and my family. If anything should happen to me, it will be because I know the name of the person who killed my husband, Pina Ariema. So either Patricia was blackmailed or she was smart enough to leave a paper trail to make it look like she was. Exactly. Either way, she's back in the game. When it's Patricia's turn to take the stand, the J. Crew look is gone. The old Patricia is back, and she's in head to toe Gucci. Ooh, nice. If you can't wear the skin of your ex husband, You can always wear his brand. Love it. That should be Gucci's new slogan. On the stand, Patrizia tells the court how much she loved Maurizio. We were the most beautiful couple in the world, she says. But after Rodolfo's death, her husband began to change. He stopped listening to her and took advice from all the wrong people. She says he became a pillow that took the form of whoever last sat there. 
So he became an ass. Yep. And she started to hate him. And then, after Maurizio left her and destroyed the family business, she really hated him. But this business about her killing him because he was going to marry Paola, it's nonsense. She tells the room, he had more than one blue-eyed blonde who stayed three steps behind him. Paola wasn't special enough to marry. Nocerino grinds his teeth. The jury looks like they're eating it up. Patrizia's entitlement is on full display, but they don't find it repulsive. They find it enthralling. He figuratively rolls up his sleeves and goes in for the kill. He asks her about her diaries, where she constantly wrote about her husband. He directs the jury to an entry on the date of Maurizio's death. It was only one word, paradisos, which means paradise in Greek. What did Patrizia mean by this? Patrizia answers that it was just a phrase that spoke to her, maybe a potential name for a villa. Mm-hmm. And then, in an entry 10 days before the murder, she wrote, There's no crime that money cannot buy. How can she explain that? Patrizia shrugs this off, says she has a lot of time on her hands and likes playing around with words. It's not a great answer. Nocerino thinks she's faltering. So, he gets aggressive. If she is the victim of Pina's plot, why didn't she go to the police? And why would an innocent woman pay for a blackmail scheme? The court is silent, waiting for an answer. But Patrizia is ready for this. She testifies that Pina threatened her and her daughters, said that if she could kill Maurizio, she could kill them too. So, Patrizia paid. Nocerino's brow furrows. He wishes she'd stumbled here, not had an answer. Then she says, Besides, Maurizio's death is something I had wanted for so many years. It seemed to me like a fair price to pay. A hint of a smile pulls at Nocerino's mouth. That's the cold, arrogant Patrizia he wanted the jury to see. But will this one misstep be enough to get the conviction? Will Patrizia's entitlement finally work against her? It's November 3rd, 1998, and Nocerino and the rest of the world are about to find out. Six jurors file into the room. The judge takes his seat. Nocerino sends up a little prayer, but keeps his face blank. Whatever happens next, he can't show relief or disappointment. The judge reads from the paper, guilty. Patrizia, Pina, the driver, the hitman, all of them, guilty. Nocerino holds back a smile. All of those long nights paid off. Patrizia's finally getting what she deserves. And then the judge announces the sentences. The getaway driver gets 29 years. Pina gets 25 years. Patrizia gets 26. And the shooter gets life. Nocerino feels like he's going to be sick. In all his years as a prosecutor, he's never heard of the person who planned a murder getting less time than the hired gun. With good behavior, Patrizia could be out in just 12 to 15 years. He can only hope that those 12 to 15 years will feel like a lifetime. That they're humbling and painful enough to finally make Patrizia pay for what she's done. It's 1998 in Milan. Patrizia checks into what she jokingly calls Vittore Residence. It's her nickname for San Vittore Prison. But despite her fun name for it, the place is bleak and overcrowded. So just what Nocerino hoped for. Yes, Patrizia's having a very hard time adjusting. For starters, her cell is barely 70 square feet and she shares it with two other inmates. The other convicts already seem to hate her, and the food is disgusting. She makes her mom drop off meatloaf and other homemade meals every Friday. 
But then she doesn't have a place to stash the leftovers. <laughs> so she has the gall to ask the director of the prison to let her buy a refrigerator for her cell. Not surprisingly, the director's like, um, no. Patrizia's taken aback. Okay, different approach. What if she buys fridges for all the inmates? It would be a twofer. She gets to eat meatloaf on Monday and buy some new friends. You get a fridge, and you get a fridge, <laughs> and you get a fridge. <laughs> but when she presents this idea to the director, he looks at her like she's lost her mind. No way is he going to put refrigerators in all the cells. What is this, the Four Seasons? So she doesn't get a fridge, and she doesn't get any new friends. Instead, the other prisoners constantly pick fights with her. They spit on her and throw volleyballs at her head during group exercise breaks. Patrizia becomes so depressed, she tries to hang herself with her bed sheets. Oh, God. Finally, her lawyers step in. They can't stop the bullying, but they can do something about the loneliness. They negotiate to have Patrizia's pet ferret, Bambi, come and stay with her. Okay, but does Bambi get a vote in this? <laughs> no, but it works. Patrizia loves this little furball. It's just enough to keep her going. For now. In 2011, Patrizia gets some amazing news. They're ready to release her on parole. 13 years would be shaved off her sentence. Ah, uh, to be a rich white woman. Seriously, the dream. But there's just one condition. She has to get a job. So she turns the offer down. What? She tells her lawyers that she's never worked a day in her life and she's not about to start now. Patrizia would rather stay in her cell with Bambi. That is until one day. Bambi's sunbathing on Patrizia's bed. One of her cellmates comes in and doesn't notice her lying there. Her cellmate sits on poor little Bambi and squishes her to death. Patrizia's now all alone. She swallows her pride and agrees to the work release deal. At the age of 64, after 16 years in prison, Patrizia moves out of her cell. The court orders her to live with her 89-year-old mother, and it hits her that she might have just traded one prison for another. Her mom, Silvana, is not much nicer than the inmates. Patrizia actually says, sometimes I wish I was back inside Vittore residence because my mother is very difficult. She berates me every day for no reason. And it gets worse. Patrizia is broke. So she's trying to get what she's owed from the divorce settlement. Hang on. She's still entitled to Maurizio's money, even though she was convicted of plotting his death? Yeah, that's the million-dollar question. Actually, it's more like multi-million. Her lawyers have filed a claim for the money, and the court is deliberating on whether or not Patrizia should get it. And currently, the case is tied up with no end in sight. So right now, she doesn't have a dime. Her daughters, on the other hand, are living the high life in Switzerland. Allegra and Alessandra inherited their father's massive estate and fortune, but they won't give their mom any financial support. And even worse, they don't want to speak to her or see her. Patrizia isn't even allowed to meet her two grandsons. I mean, she did plot to kill their grandfather. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, hopefully they spend a chunk of their inheritance on some much-needed therapy. Patrizia's new life outside of prison isn't quite shaping up how she hoped, but at least she has the job she never wanted to keep her busy. As part of the get out of jail deal, Patrizia works as a design consultant for the costume jewelry company Bozart. I mean, most ex cons sling burgers after prison, <laughs> but okay. Right. Well, Bozart thinks Patrizia is perfect to help drive publicity. After all, Patrizia is photographed all the time. Paparazzi follow her everywhere, and she welcomes it. It makes her feel like her old self. She poses in dark, giant sunglasses and lots of Beaux-Arts jewelry, and she keeps her pet macaw on her shoulder. Surprisingly, when the pictures come out, people talk more about the bird than the jewelry. Wow, I can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bozart starts to worry that hiring Patrizia might not have been the best move. In fact, she's becoming more of a liability. When a reporter asks her why she killed her husband, she quips, because he irritated me. <laughs> and then when she's asked why she didn't shoot Maurizio herself, she jokes, because my eyesight is not so good. I didn't want to miss. 
I mean, it's a reason. (laughs) (laughs) Her quotes go viral. People are shocked. But Patrizia doesn't think the rules that apply to everyone else apply to her. And she's not necessarily wrong. In 2017, the Italian Court of Appeals finally delivers a judgment on Patrizia's divorce settlement. They rule that she's entitled to it. A deal's a deal. Murder or no murder. Seems like a pretty dangerous precedent. Yeah. Patrizia is awarded about $1.2 million per year and a lump sum of approximately $22 million for the back years, the years she spent in prison. But before she can go on a shopping spree, Patrizia learns that the court has also ruled her unfit to manage the money herself. Her mother gets complete control of her finances. Mm-hmm. Womp womp. Silvana's grip over the cash doesn't last too long, though. That same year, she dies, and Patrizia gets it all. Plus, she inherits a whole second fortune from her mother. Patrizia is loaded. But even with all this money in the bank, she can't seem to stay out of trouble with the law. Luckily, this time, she's not the defendant. She's the plaintiff. After her mom died, Patrizia realized she couldn't actually manage all that money on her own. So she turned to her old cellmate, who may or may not have killed Bambi, to find her an estate manager. I don't know that ex-con would be the way I'd go to find an estate manager. (laughs) Yeah, well, Patrizia gives this estate manager access to her whole fortune. And somehow... $3.5 million goes missing. Okay, does she get any of it back? Well, it's still an open investigation, so we'll just have to see how it unfolds. And the indignities keep coming. Ridley Scott decides to turn her life into a movie. How does that piss her off? You'd think she'd love the attention. Well, she's pissed because Lady Gaga, who's playing her, never reached out. No phone call, no lunch radio silence. Patrizia feels snubbed. And on top of that, she's worried about her daughters. She's nervous that the film could traumatize them and make them relive their father's death. Right. Their father's (laughs) death that she orchestrated. Right. But it sounds like the real reason she's pissed is because she's worried that the filmmakers won't capture how much she really loved Maurizio, that the audience won't understand their relationship. Patrizia once said... If I could see Maurizio again, I would tell him that I love him because he's the person who has mattered most to me in my life. But I think he'd say the feeling wasn't mutual. Hmm, would this be before or after she puts a bullet in his head? (laughs) Right. Patrizia is a strange and complicated woman. To this day, she still hasn't confessed to Maurizio's murder. The closest she's ever come is to say, I'm not guilty, but I'm also not innocent. And she wants everyone to know that, in her heart of hearts, she's still a Gucci. She'll always be a Gucci. In her words, she's the most Gucci of them all. This is episode three of our three-part series, Murder in the House of Gucci. We use many sources when researching our stories, including Vanity Fair, The Guardian, People Magazine, and The House of Gucci by Sarah Gay Forden. On our next episode, we'll be talking to Sarah herself about writing House of Gucci and consulting on the new Ridley Scott movie that was based on her book. We'll also be talking to fashion writer Leah Faye Cooper about Gucci's place in the fashion world and how it just keeps getting bigger. I'm Brooke Sifrin. And I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. Jojo Wright wrote this episode. Our editor is Allison Reimer. Our audio engineer is Sergio Enriquez. Sound design is by Sam Ada. Kate Young is our associate producer. And our senior producers are Natalie Shisha and Ben Gray. Our executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Marsha Louie for Wondery. <laughs>